Newton's second law is very useful in helping us with dynamic situations. So in other words, when things end up moving, or maybe they don't, but uh, when we're considering forces as well. So what I'd like to do is uh, give you Newton's second law, and I'm going to give it to you in two forms. And uh, this one, I think, is actually the best one, uh, which goes like this. So it's F, and I'm going to put a little net here. That's going to imply, like we were looking at before, an unbalanced force. That's actually the change in momentum over a change in time. This right here, this is the, yeah, this is Newton's second law. So maybe we should define things here. So again, uh, this one right here, we've got F net. That's the resultant or unbalanced force. So the key thing here, because we would have to add up all the different forces acting on some object. And in the end, if there's an unbalanced force, then we have a net force. Um, oops, I guess I shouldn't say forces unbalanced force. Now this net force, well that's measured in newtons or kilogram meters per second squared I guess, but we could, uh, we'll, we'll see some of those units we can use. So delta P, that represents a change in momentum. Now momentum is a quantity that is equal to, uh, well maybe we'll just put this off to the side here, that momentum is actually m times v. In other words, the mass of an object times its velocity. Momentum is technically a vector, so we should probably put little uh, vector signs on top of it. And it turns out, well, it's right here, it's right here, and it's right here. I have to be careful with the vector signs here. So this is a change in momentum. Now if you look at this though, if momentum is equal to mass times velocity, well, that means then that the momentum will have units of, let's see, units of mass are kilograms and units of velocity are meters per second. So if that's the case, then this is the unit of momentum. And of course we have delta T, well, that's a change in time. And that will be measured in, well, normally in seconds or just S for short. So that's F net equals delta P over delta T. That's Newton's second law. What this tells you then, this is the, the meaning of it, is that if you have a resultant force, well, that means then that you're going to have a change in momentum, which means a force can cause a change in speed or velocity. So earlier when I had said that C forces were all about, you know, applying a change in uh, velocity, this is why. Now the the version that a lot of students have learned, so instead of this version right here, a lot of students have actually learned this way. They've learned F equals MA. This one's a bit limited if you just write it like this. I'd like to say F net equals MA first of all. So again, F net is still your resultant or unbalanced force. That's still the same. But um, if we look at this then, we could say then that... Um, well, M is the mass, and that's measured in kilograms. And we've got A, that's the acceleration, and that's measured in meters per second squared. So MS to the minus two. This is the version that a lot of students have uh, used instead. And if I want to be careful here, I need to make sure I have my vector symbol. So force is a vector and acceleration is a vector, but mass is a scalar, just like time is a scalar. Remember, vector means has a direction and a magnitude. So that means it has a value and it has to point somewhere. And the acceleration will be pointing in the same direction as the net force. So what this tells you, again, it's just a different formulation of this one. And this one says the same sort of thing. If you have an unbalanced force acting on something, then it's going to cause an acceleration, which means again, acceleration is actually defined as the change in velocity. Don't forget that. So acceleration is actually the change in velocity or a change in time. So you see again, an acceleration causes a change in velocity. Now, if you like the calculus notation, you could actually say that the acceleration at a function of time here is actually going to be, well, we could say here the derivative of V versus T. 
This is just how we can write it in calculus form. This just tells us that uh, it's the derivative of velocity versus time. In other words, you have to find an equation for velocity and take its time derivative. Well, that's just another way of saying dv dt like this, delta v delta t. But I digress. This right here is the key thing here, knowing that a net force causes a change in velocity, either because it's through a momentum term here or because it's acceleration. But it's actually the same thing going on. It's just a different formulation, just a different version of the same thing happening. So I thought uh, maybe we could take a look at an example. Um, so I've got an example here. It's a little bit silly, but hey, why not? Um, I don't want to just have a regular box rolling down a hill or a box being you know, moved. So, um, well, we've got a velociraptor here. This is not at all realistic because, of course, velociraptors lived millions of years ago on Earth. And, uh, well, this is now, so velociraptor couldn't really be riding a bike. But uh, we're going to assume that velociraptors are dragging Mitch with a force of 20 newtons to the right. Now, friction is going to act on me um, with 5 newtons to the left. So if my mass is 75 kilograms, what will be my acceleration? So in this case, the key to doing this is to, send, well, first of all, to do a free body diagram maybe of me. So if this is me here, so this will be like this. I'm not a very good artist, so I'm just going to assume that these forces are just going to be acting on me like this. So technically, I've got a downwards force of gravity, and I've got an upwards force of, well, normal force. But the good news is those cancel each other out, so that's no problem. But I'm also being given a force applied to me, a force that's 20 newtons to the right. So if that's the case, then I'm going to draw one that's, well, I don't know how much 20 newtons is. Let's say it's that much. Actually, that's not very accurate because my downwards force should actually be lots. But oh well, let's just, let's just focus on this one to the right here. So we're going to say that force is 20 newtons to the right. But of course, while I'm dragging on the ground, there's also friction. I mean, if you've ever tried dragging, uh, I don't know, a younger sibling, you know, along the ground, or if you've ever, you know, tried rubbing your hands together really fast, you'll see that your hands actually heat up. Or let's say you're on a carpet and someone sort of drags you along the carpet. The carpet makes you get really warm wherever it is that the carpet is touching. And that's because of friction. So friction is a way of, well, friction opposes the motion. So in this case, if I'm being dragged to the right, then friction will act opposite to that. So I should draw a small little arrow to the left. Small, because 5 newtons is a lot smaller than 20. In fact, well, it should be exactly four times less big, but uh, I don't think that's exactly accurate, but good enough. So the idea behind this then is to try to look at, well, what's the net force? Or if I go back here, what's the unbalanced force? Because it's very possible that these two forces would be equal. What if I said the forward force is 20 newtons, but friction acts 20 newtons to the left? Well, then I wouldn't have an unbalanced force. I would have a balanced force because they would cancel each other out. And because of that, I would not be accelerating because there would be no net force. In this case, however, they're not equal. So you can actually then figure out which one wins. Well, the one that's biggest wins. So we know that uh, it's 20 newtons is the one that wins. And 20 minus 5 is going to be 15 newtons to the right. So that will be my, therefore, F net equals 15 newtons to the right. So it's going to be as if this velociraptor is dragging me to the right with a force of 15 newtons. So now the question is, what is my acceleration? Well, I could either use the first equation or the second equation for Newton's second law. I'd probably use the second one just because it already has an acceleration term in it. So it's, it's pretty easy to use then. So I say F net equals MA, and it's always a good idea to show your teachers or whoever it is you're looking at, or maybe just for your own notes, it's a good idea to write down the equation you're using. So F net equals MA. And therefore, if I want the acceleration, well, A equals F over M. F net, of course. So in that case, then I have my net force is 15 newtons to the right divided by 75 kilograms. And then I'll just get out my trusty calculator, and I need to actually calculate this. So I need to do 15, so 1, 5, divided by 7, 5. I press enter, and I get an answer of 0 
So that means then that I could state with certainty then that my acceleration will be 0 0.2 meters per second squared. And it's important to state the direction. So this means I will accelerate an acceleration of 0.2 meters per second squared. And you might think, is that is that a big number? I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but how big is it? Well, I always like to compare things to an acceleration that we all know very well, which is 9.81. That's the sort of magic number that, you know, if I jumped off a cliff or something like that, that would be my acceleration going down. So this is actually quite small. So I wouldn't be accelerating that that much. So now here comes the next part of the question. This is now where we not only just use acceleration, but now we use kinematics. So if I'm initially at rest, what will be my velocity after traveling a distance of two kilometers? So if you think about this now, because I'm accelerating, I need some equations of accelerated motion. Um, and so if you look at uh, different equations for accelerated motion, turns out, uh, well, what I like to do, I don't know if you remember me doing this before, but I like to write down what everything actually means. So u is the initial speed, v is the final speed, a is the acceleration, s is the distance or the displacement, and t is the time elapsed. So I like to write this and I call this uvast. So that way then I can write, well, what's my initial speed? Initial speed, well, if I'm initially at rest, that's zero. What's my final speed? Oh, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna put a star there, that's what I want. What's my acceleration? Well, I found that it's 0 0.2. And because it's got proper units, I'm just going to be sloppy here and not put in the units. And I know that it's to the right. What's my displacement? That's how far I've traveled. Well, I've traveled a distance of two kilometers. So should I just put a two in here? Nope, not at all. I should not do that. I should, uh, by the way, the way I said nope reminds me of these uh, silly commercials for Chuck Testa. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, yeah, maybe you should check it out. It's actually pretty funny videos. But um, okay, so my displacement is not two meters, it's two kilometers. And two kilometers is 2,000 meters. We should always put uh, regular units in here. My time, well, I don't know the time and I hopefully don't care. So I can look at my four equations of motion and try to find one that avoids a t. If you look carefully for the four equations of accelerated motion, you'll see this one. That there's v squared equals u squared plus 2as. So if I use that one, well, my initial speed is zero, so that cancels out. And actually, I want v, so that's actually really easy. I don't have much algebra to do at all. I can just say v is technically plus or minus the square root of 2as. But I'm going to knock out the negative one because I am I know that my speed has to be in the same direction as my acceleration. Since the acceleration is to the right, I've decided to call that positive. So I'm just going to say, therefore, that v is going to be just the positive square root of 2 times my acceleration, which is 0 0.2, times my displacement, which is 2,000. Well, what this does then is 0.2 times 2,000 is 200. 200 times 2 is, what would that be, 400? No, what would that be? 0.2. Well, actually, you know what? Let's actually just figure it out. So if I go ahead and try to calculate this, it's not going to work out very nicely. I was just trying to see if it worked out to be a nice answer, but actually it doesn't. That's where I was going with my head here. So 2,000 times 0.2 times 2. I'm just going to figure out that thing within the square root here. And then I just want to take the square root of that answer. That'll give me... Okay, so 28.28427 da, 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 units. But the thing is, I want to use the right amount of significant figures here. So because I have two significant figures here, and I have, well, actually, I meant it to be two, so I should have said 5.0. I meant to use two significant figures everywhere. So I meant to say 5.0, you know, 20, 75, 2.0. And let's assume that we're just using two significant figures everywhere. Well, then I would have an answer then of approximately, uh, well, I could round that then to around 29 meters per second. I put the little dot on the equal sign, remember, because it's not exactly equal to 29. It's roughly 29 meters per second.
And so if you're not sure, well, how fast is that really? Um, you could always convert that to kilometers per hour if you felt like it. That's always a fun uh, little thing to try to do. So let's just say I want 25 meters and I'm going to put the seconds on the bottom. My whole goal then is to use uh, either things on the top or the bottom to cancel out the things I don't want. I don't want meters, I want kilometers. And I don't want seconds, I want hours. So I want to get rid of the meters, so I'm going to put something with meters on the bottom and kilometers on the top. And do I know any things like how many kilometers in a meter or how many meters in a kilometer? I sure do. I know that one kilometer is 1,000 meters. So if I did it just like this, if I just did 29 times 1 divided by 1,000, I would end up having my answer in, well, let's see, the meters cancel out, it's top and the bottom. So I'd have my answer in kilometers per second. But I don't want kilometers per second, I want kilometers per hour. How do I do that? Well, I've got to get rid of my seconds. So I'm going to put something with seconds on the top and hours on the bottom. I know that there's 60 seconds in a one minute, and there's 60 minutes in one hour, so 60 times 60 is 3,600. So then I know that there's 3,600 seconds in one hour. It turns out if I do it like that, the seconds cancel out. So 29 times 1 times 3,600, all that divided by 1,000. And what a lot of people sort of end up memorizing at least is that, well, you always end up having this number of 3.6. If you look, 3,600 divided by 1,000 is 3.6. So for people who've done a lot of this stuff, they end up knowing that you either multiply by 3.6 or divide by 3.6. But see, it didn't just come from nowhere. This is where it came from, in case you forgot. So we can always do that. So let's take 29 and we'll multiply it by 3.6. And we'll figure out then um, how many kilometers per hour that is. So if I go over here, so that means 29 times 3.6. So that's around 100 kilometers an hour. So that is actually pretty darn fast. I mean, at least if you're uh, used to this sort of thing, I mean, that's sort of highway driving speeds. Now, that's maybe not so realistic. And the reason why this isn't realistic, well, my example is quite ridiculous for starters. Why would a velociraptor be pulling on me? Um, it's not Jurassic Park here. We don't live with the velociraptors. But even if I was, there would be other factors here as well. So, I mean, obviously, friction would be pretty serious force here. That means I'd actually be really heating up. If I was being dragged on the ground that fast, I'd probably have some sort of wear and tear on my body. That wouldn't be very fun. But uh, we're also assuming no air resistance. So we're assuming a lot of other things. But you can see the idea. We can solve for just about anything. So as long as you have an unbalanced force, you'll cause an acceleration. That acceleration then can be used in order to calculate all sorts of stuff, like how long does it take to travel somewhere, or how fast are you going, um, how far will you travel in a certain time. So you can use these examples from kinematics, you know, from these equations of uniformly accelerated motion, which this is, right? This is a constant acceleration. That's why it's uniform. So you can use those equations of uniformly accelerated motion to solve all sorts of awesome things. So that's the key behind Newton's second law. Very useful for us to figure out how things end up moving due to unbalanced forces.